Good morning. Ah, good afternoon. Hey there, it's Mark Binder here. It's a beautiful day outside and I'm here in the basement talking to you. If you have a laptop, um, maybe take it outside. You can watch outside, I don't mind. Uh, today, what's our agenda? Well, I am going to uh, read a letter. I am going to talk about It Ate My Sister, and then I'm going to read a story called Running Head. I know you'll enjoy it, so stick around. All right. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself and the program. I'm Mark Binder. I'm a writer and a storyteller. Usually I like to perform live, face-to-face, but that's not happening these days because, well, we all know. I've got the COVID hair going on, and, uh, well, I wanted to tell you who wrote the song uh, that you were listening to. That's a little song called Read a Little Every Day. Read a Little Every Day is a song that I wrote, actually, for Reading Week a few years back. Every year, the libraries have a summer reading program, and I wrote this little ditty called Read a Little Every Day. Uh, I didn't make it sound as good as George Dussault did. George is an amazing composer, and he arranged it and did all the music. So thanks to George for that. Um, Let me just get straight to it. Oh, I know what I wanted to do. Yeah, so uh, every week I want to answer questions from you. And so um, send me questions. Questions go to questions at markbinderbooks.com. And next time we'll have a little graphic that will go up. It'll tell you that. Um, You can just send a question to questions at markbinderbooks.com. I got this wonderful letter in the mail from Miles who lives in Narragansett, Rhode Island. It's a beautiful card. I don't know if you can see that. Let me see. Uh, No, it's getting all washed out by the... I have the world's oldest webcam here. So if if we're having a poor stream, I'm I'm on the oldest computer in the basement. Uh, Anyway, Miles writes, Thank you for your generous donation. My new pacers are keeping me safe. Love, Miles. Miles, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um... Maybe you got a book of mine. If you're watching this, uh, you can download copies while COVID is happening. We know people are a little bit tight for cash. I wanted to contribute to people and give you an easy way to have some fun. If you go to markbinder.com slash intermission, you'll see a number of books that are available for complimentary download if you use the keyword intermission when you check out. It has the bedtime storybook, King's Wolves, Princesses, and Lions, and of course, It Ate My Sister. So It Ate My Sister is this book. It's a fun book. I wrote it a few years ago. Um, Rather than tell you a lot about it right now, let me tell you a little bit about the story that I'm going to read to you. As a writer and storyteller, there are times when I will tell stories and perform them. And there are times when I will read stories Uh, and not tell them. And the story that I'm going to read to you is one of those. I have never just told this story. And the reason is I really like the language of this story. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about how I wrote the story afterwards. We're just going to leap right into this. And remember, if you have questions, uh, send me an email, questions at markbinderbooks.com. This story is called running head. When I was a kid, we used to scare each other with stories about it. It was the kind of thing that the big kids inflicted on the little kids and the little kids inflicted on their littler brothers and sisters. Of course, I heard about it from Ellen, my sister, but I also heard about it from my best friend, Dave Rover. And after my cousin Adam moved to town, he heard about it too. Running head. Some said that it was the skull of a murdered jogger. They said that it ran around the high school track after dark on every full moon. Others claimed that it was the long-haired skull of a mother who had just left her babies at home for a moment to go out for liquor and cigarettes and had driven her car into the Breakneck River Canal. She went through the windshield back before safety glass and her spine severed in several places. 
Even though she was dead on impact, I probably should have told you that this is a story for older kids, huh? If you're really young and listening to this, yeah, it's a story for older kids. Let me back that up and start that sentence over again. It's pretty gruesome. Sorry. She went... <laughs> By the way, I've decided that the name of, uh, of, of my production company is going to be, I don't know if you can see that, ah, doesn't focus, Learning Curve Productions, because we're learning this stuff on the fly. Here we go. Back it up a little bit. She went through the windshield back before safety glass, and her spine severed in several places. Even though she was dead on impact, she had to get back to her children before anything horrible happened. So she assembled the pieces as quickly as she could, leaving out part of the middle, and began running home. Still others believed that it was just a deformed head with legs. They said it was a giant head on normal-sized legs, like one of those Easter Island statues, but without the body in between. Everyone said a lot of different things. And when you were a kid, you believed a lot of those things. Maybe all of them. I mean, why wouldn't you? People were supposed to tell the truth. They weren't supposed to make up scary stories just to scare the pants off little kids, were they? But after a while, you started to realize that maybe it wasn't so likely that a jawbone would sit on top of a pair of thighs and haul its abbreviated carcass through dark and deserted streets without once getting caught by the cops, a newspaper reporter, or being clipped by a passing truck. The first time I stopped believing was the time that I told Adam what I knew about the story. He'd asked me to fill him in on the details, and when I told him what I remembered and I saw that he still needed more, I kept going. I embellished. I made stuff up just to scare him. I told him that one story was that Running Head was a golfer whose ball landed in the middle of a train tracks, and rather than taking a penalty stroke, he decided to play it where it lay. His foot got caught between the rails and the ties, and the train was coming fast. He thwacked the ball just as the cow catcher caught him. The ball landed right in the hole for a birdie, and rather than just lying down and dying, the golfer picked himself up, rolled his head on top of his pants, tightened his belt, and raced back to his foursome, all of whom met with tragic endings. I took great pleasure in whispering those words, all of whom met with tragic endings. When Adam pushed me for more details about those tragic endings, I sidestepped by talking about running heads bloodied... <laughs> I sidestepped by talking about running heads bloodied lime green trousers and spiked shoes with those funky tasseled laces. Adam's eyes widened in amazement, and I realized that I'd completely hooked him. If I'd wanted to, I could have told him stories that would have kept him up for a month. To be honest, I thought about it. But then I thought about what my Aunt Dot would do to me if I kept going, and I decided it wasn't worth it. Of course, I don't believe in running head, I told Adam with a scoff. I was wrong. It was summertime, the night of a full moon, and I was biking home from a late night session of diplomacy at Dave Rover's. When I was a kid, everybody biked everywhere all the time. We were too young to have cars, but nobody minded. You could get around pretty far and pretty fast with two wheels and two legs. We didn't wear helmets back then because nobody knew how dangerous head injuries were, and we didn't have flashing halogen LED taillights because they hadn't been invented yet. After dark, we biked in the dark and kept our eyes open for parked cars full of teenagers and swerving cars full of inebriated adults. Nobody I knew ever got killed or even injured except for my friend Joel, who was clotheslined by a car door that suddenly opened in front of him. And that was in broad daylight on a busy street. He was fine. I guess we were all just lucky. Diplomacy is this old-fashioned semi-board game that's all about conquering the world by negotiation, backstabbing, and lying. It's sort of a primer for world politics. We were a bunch of dorky guys who liked pretending that we were international leaders, and the sessions got pretty heated and lasted hours without much real progress or change which I guess was another lesson about the way the world really worked. We made huge bowls of popcorn, drank gallons of caffeinated soda, and aside from waking up Rover's little sister with our shouting, stayed out of trouble. About quarter to twelve, Dave's mother broke up the party. She'd called our parents and said we were on our way. We all shook hands and promised to meet again next week. 
While I wheeled my bike out from behind Rover's garage, he said, You better watch out. I'll be careful. No, he said. It's a full moon. He nodded up at the sky. The moon was high and bright. It was like a glowing white beach ball. The man in the moon looked like an old-fashioned newspaper cartoon, grinning and wild-eyed. Yeah, it's bright, I said, throwing my leg over the bar and sliding into my saddle. Easier to see things. It's almost midnight, Dave said. You're going to be rolling by the graveyard at midnight on the night of a full moon. What are you thinking, ghosts? He shook his head. Nah, running head. Running head? Now he nodded. Yep. You trying to scare me, I said. He nodded. Yeah, I am. I know you don't believe in running head, but it's real. That cemetery, night of a full moon, running head? I'd be worried. Well, I shrugged. Not me. See you tomorrow at the swimming pool. And I pedaled off. I wasn't afraid. Really, I wasn't. Not at first. You know how somebody's words get inside your brain whether you want them to or not? They say something and you kind of blow them off, but the words stick. And they begin to spin around and around, over and over, repeating themselves like a mental version of the Chinese water torture. Drip, drip, drip. David's words were zipping through my brain. Full moon, cemetery, running head. I'm going to pause for a moment because it looks like I'm having issues with the stream here. I have no idea if this is working or not. I'm looking at the thing on. Well, I'm going to pause for just a second. Sorry about this, guys. Well, it looks like it's still going. I guess it's just on one screen that it's frozen. Sorry about that. I'm going to go back to the story. Where was I? Oh, yes. Drip, drip, drip. David's words were zipping through my brain. Full moon, cemetery, running head. Now, I need to give you a little geographical description of my town. It was a pretty ordinary place. I lived on one side and David lived on the other. In the old days, you'd call his neighborhood the other side of the tracks, but the property values had gone up and there really were no poor, se poor sections. We had a little downtown with a public library, city hall, police station, hospital, businesses, science museum, and so on. For me to get to David's house, I had to bike through my neighborhood, through downtown, up Steeple Hill, past the old churchyard, zip down Steeple Hill, over the railroad tracks, around the graveyard, and then through his neighborhood to his house. In a car, it was 10 minutes. On a bike, if you were going fast, it was about 25 minutes because of the hill, which was gigantic. Every big snowstorm, some crazy kid got hurt because he'd sledded too far and too fast and hit a tree. I know, because I'd gotten creamed twice. We all kept doing it because it was a lot of fun. Getting back home from David's house was the same thing in reverse. You really couldn't go on any other way because the Breakneck River Canal was on one side of town and the prison was on the other. The light from the moon was a beacon in my eyes as I started paddling through David's neighborhood. I'm not afraid, I said. I'm cool. Then up ahead I saw the graveyard. Our town is pretty old, and the graveyard was original. It went back to the 1700s, and all of our founders and their children and grandchildren were buried there. It had Civil War veterans and almost everyone else who died and wasn't buried in some churchyard or another. At daylight, sometimes weird ladies went around and made charcoal rubbings of the grave markers. At night, it had the usual amount of spooky, goofy party stuff that any place like that attracts. The wrought iron fence was high and pointy, but there were enough places where the bars were down that if you wanted to squeeze your way in, you could. Or if something wanted to squeeze its way out. Cemetery? Full moon? I sat up and, pedaling with no hands, pushed the button on my digital watch. The red LED numbers blinked on. 1159. I wasn't afraid. It was one of those suburban myths, a spooky story that they told Boy Scouts to give them a thrill. 
Nevertheless, it wouldn't hurt to pick up the pace. I was rolling at a pretty good speed when I took the right turn to go around the far side of the graveyard toward the train tracks, fast enough that I almost didn't hear the sounds. A creak and a thump and then footsteps. My heart was already racing, but that was just the energy I was using to bike, right? It was my imagination. Cemetery, graveyard, full moon, midnight. I pulled my hands off the handlebars fast enough to activate the watch again. Twelve o'clock. Running head. My heart was pounding faster, but there, it was nothing. There was nothing following me. It was not happening. I wasn't going to look back. Why waste the energy? As Satchel Page once said, don't look back. Something might be gaining on you. I looked back. There was nothing there. <laughs> I gasped with relief. I didn't see anything. There really was nothing there. My shoulders heaved as the tension began to release. I slowed my pedaling. And that's when I heard the footsteps again, coming closer and closer. Rapid, slapping footsteps. It was like the whap, whap, whap of a wet fish being splattered on the sidewalk. It didn't sound like a person. When a human being runs, there's a rhythm, but it's irregular. There are breaks in the motion from dodging obstacles or adjusting for terrain. This sound was relentless. The rhythm was regular, like there was something stuck in a piece of damp machinery thwacking against something solid. Running head, graveyard, full moon, midnight, no way. I looked back again and I almost fell off my bike. It was a gigantic head the size of a medicine ball with two gigantic eyes, big and bloodshot red. You could see them glaring in the moonlight. It had no nose, just a flat spot with two holes where the nose should be. And it had a gigantic gaping mouth with big white sharp teeth, the kind you see on crocodiles or in a shark's maw. The jaw was opening and closing, clicking and clacking, and this long purple tongue was slathering in and out and licking spittle and drool between chomps. Beneath the head were two of the tiniest feet I had ever seen, but they were moving like blurs on skinny bird legs. I hit a bump in the road, which was a good thing because it woke me up. Whether or not this thing was real, I needed to get home. So I turned my face firmly forward and started to ride. Pat spat, pat splat, pat spat. I shouldn't have slowed down. Maybe it wouldn't have chased me if I hadn't shown any weakness. I gave myself some energy and pushed harder. Pat, 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 pat. It was speeding up, too. I grabbed my handlebars tighter and felt my knuckles go white. I stood on the pedals, bent my knees, and hit the train tracks faster than recommended speed. Badoom, 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 badoom. My arms were jolted as I rolled over the rails. I looked back. It was still there. I'd gained a little bit of distance, but watched in horror as it jumped the steel rails like an Olympic hurdler from Munchkinland. Pat, spat, leap. Pat, splat, leap. This was freaking me out. I stayed standing and began to run on my bike. That's when I saw Steeple Hill right in front of me, like Mount Everest or a wall. It might as well have been. I was already out of breath. There was something on my tail, and whether it was real or not, I didn't care. I had to get up the highest hill in the world at midnight with a full moon shining and this thing chasing after me. People say that human beings are capable of amazing feet of amazing feats of strength. They talk about mothers lifting cars off their babies. They talk about lost boys walking for months across deserts. They don't talk about what happens when you run out of steam and know you're going to die. My heart was pounding. My lungs were aching. I couldn't feel my toes as I pushed my legs left and right. Pat, spat, it was louder. I didn't look back. It was gaining. I couldn't stand any taller. I couldn't move any faster. The hill was getting steeper and steeper. I was in the easiest gear on my bike and I was barely moving. It would have been faster to get off and run. Pat splat. But getting off my bike would have taken time and if I slowed down or fell, I might never get back on. And then I remembered. Steeple Hill was a tall hill in all directions. That's why they built the church up there, so that it would be the highest building that anyone could see. When I got to the top, if I got to the top, once I was past the church, 
it was all downhill. Pat spat, pat splat, chomp slurp. The mind is an amazing motivator. Combine the disgusting t- Combine the disgusting sounds of those tiny feet, the clacking teeth, and that purple tongue with my realization that I might actually be able to get away. My legs went faster, beyond cramp and pain to this place where I felt like I was pushing pistons. The bike kept moving. I crested the top of Steeple Hill, shifted into another gear, and kept pushing past the churchyard. For a brief moment, I hoped that some savior-like deity would come out and expunge this evil thing from the world. Didn't happen. It was past the churchyard, and it was still coming after me. I could hear it. I glanced back, and it was closer. It was bigger. Its teeth were glittering in the moonlight. I pumped and pumped, gathering speed, hooked over the top of the hill, shifted into my hardest gear, pumped and pumped again as gravity grabbed me and started to pull. You add 32 feet per second squared to the force of terror, and you get a lot of speed. I was moving fast. I crouched low over my handlebars and felt the wind on my face. I was a human boy on wheels, and that thing only had little stubby feet. No way it was going to get me. The rumbling noise started slowly. I thought it was thunder. I thought it was thunder at first, but the sky was clear and cloud free. I didn't see any lightning. I looked back and the head was rolling. It had retracted its feet and was rolling like a boulder down the side of a mountain. They say that objects fall at the same rate so they so that my rolling and its rolling should have kept the same distance apart, but it was gaining on me. Maybe it was lubricating its slide with its tongue. I don't know. I tried to pedal faster, but my gears couldn't catch up with the speed of my flywheel. It was getting closer, and there was nothing I could do. I was watching the ground. The bottom of the hill was dead ahead. It was looking at the bottom. It was, it was like looking at the bottom of a cliff. We were almost there. I was out of steam. I was out of energy. I was out of ideas. It was breathing hard with anticipation and hunger. I could smell the fetid odor of its rotting breath. In the corner of my eye, I saw sparks flying behind me as its chattering teeth chipped off pieces of the concrete road. I was never going to see my parents again. Rover was going to feel really lousy when he read about me in the papers. Ellen, I didn't care so much about because she'd probably convince my parents to knock a hole through our bedroom walls so she could make my room into another closet for all her clothes. I hit the bottom of the hill with a jolt. I looked up and saw the science museum looming in front of me. I didn't think. I banked. I turned sharply right, bounced the curb in front of the science museum, wobbled, but didn't lose control. Newton said that a body in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted upon by an external force. This thing didn't have a body, but it also didn't have a steering wheel. The running head went straight. It popped over the curb, rolled right up the steps, and slammed through the front door of the science museum, breaking the old wood like a battering ram through popsicle sticks. I didn't wait around to see if it was going to come after me. I booked home. I don't even remember the rest of the ride. I dropped my bike in the driveway, ran inside the house, locked the door, ran to my room, locked my door, jumped into bed, and pulled the covers over my head. And then it was morning. Mom was making pancakes for breakfast. On the front page of the newspaper was the headline, Vandals Wreck Museum. The lead, paragraphs, the, <clears throat> the lead paragraph read, Last night, shortly after midnight, unknown vandals broke into the science museum, trashing exhibits, wreaking havoc, and completely destroying old buckwheat, the beloved stuffed Civil War horse that has served as unofficial mascot of the city and a favorite of children for so many years. Inquiries are still proceeding, but the police currently have no clues. When my dad came in to yell at me because he nearly backed the car over my bike, I ran over to him and gave him a big hug, which left him very confused. At the pool, when Rover asked how was the ride, I told him. He said I was making it up. I wasn't. After that, 
When I biked to and from rovers, I went blocks out of my way to keep distance from that cemetery. And if the moon was full, I slept over. The end. Woo! I always feel like that's a ride. <laughs> uh, when I started uh, doing this story, um, there was such energy to it. I, I, I tried to do a recording of this, sort of pre-record this, but I found that I wasn't giving it enough of the oomph. So thanks so much for listening to that. I appreciate it. Let me tell you where the story came from. Um, if you look at the book of It Ate My Sister, I don't know that I'm going to be able to show you this because the silly thing doesn't focus. No, I'm not going to do that. At the top of every page, there's this thing. It says, It Ate My Sister on one side, and it says Running Head, or the name of whatever story it is on the other side. And I got a book once. It was a review copy of a book uh, before they had finished doing it. And on the top of every page, it had the title of the book on one side. And then on the other side, it, it said running head, because that's what you call that part of a book. It's the running header or the running head. And I, I saw that. And I thought, wow, running head. What a great name for a story. I wonder what that's about. And then I sat down and wrote this. So... I want to thank you again for tuning in. I'm going to keep doing this uh, for at least the next few weeks to see how things go. My name is Mark Binder. Um, if you have questions about this story or any of the stories in It Ate My Sister or any of my work as a writer, drop me an email. Send it to questions at markbinderbooks.com. And, uh, oh, hey, make sure you subscribe to the station. I don't know where the button is. I should probably point to it. Is it over here? Is it over there? I don't know. And, and um, what else did I want to say? Oh, yeah, we'll be back next Friday at 1 p.m. with more stories. Uh, and I want to thank you so very Oh, wait, wait, I remember. Go to the website. Go to markbinder.com slash intermission. Download a copy of it won't cost you anything, and you'll enjoy it. Oh, and if you want to get a, to buy a copy, you can Venmo me 25 bucks to Mark Binder Books. We've got some copies upstairs. I know it's a plug, but that's what you do these days. I want to thank you guys so very much for listening. Take care. Have a great week. Bye. <laughs>